There are different ways of getting dopants into a semiconductor. There's diffusion, and then there's implantation, which is the next lecture. We're going to talk about diffusion right now. You have your substrate, which is bulk semiconductor. And you want to get dopants to go into the surface right here. But maybe you don't want dopants to go into the surface right here. And so you might mask it. That is, you just cover it up so that those dopants can't go in. Then you expose it to this vapor of dopant atoms. And those dopant atoms will slowly diffuse into the surface. If this is a substrate of, of silicon, you may want to, you know, put dopant with boron to make a p-type, or arsenic or phosphorus to make an n-type. Those are some of the common dopants. They slowly work their way into the surface. As the dopant atoms go to the surface, they can travel into the surface two different ways. And it has something to do with the size of the atom that's moving. First, we have vacancy diffusion, where here's the surface, and the diffusing atom enters in, and it hops across vacancies. Just about any atom can do that if you want it to diffuse in, because this is a big, huge open space where you have vacancies in the crystal. You have a crystal lattice of silicon. But there are sometimes missing atoms. It's a defect that can be filled with a visitor if it comes along. Now, if these atoms are small, they don't have to sit in the vacancies, in which case they can travel through the interstitials, which they can you know, diffuse at a higher, higher rate if they do that. Small atoms like phosphorus and boron are smaller than silicon. Here's an example of an atom in an interstitial. This means a space in between, and it can slip through that way. Phosphorus and boron can either do diffusion by interstitial diffusion or vacancy diffusion, but the larger atoms like antimony and arsenic are only doing vacancy hopping. Here's a famous version of the periodic table prepared by Slater back in the 60s, uh, just compiled from a lot of measurements that have shown up in the open literature. These are measured values of atomic radii, which in the mid-60s were, were already published. Slater compiled them. There's, a, there's another compilation that was done a few years later of theoretically calculated radii, but I'm just showing you one of them. Useful reference is that you know that boron is larger than oxygen, interesting, but smaller than silicon. Phosphorus is a little smaller than silicon, but arsenic is larger than silicon. Antimony is much larger than silicon, so arsenic and antimony don't slip through the interstitials of silicon. There's two of things. Okay, so I talked about two ways that the impurities travel through the host matrix material uh, by diffusion. Now I'm going to talk to you about two ways of promoting diffusion. That is, how can you, as the person controlling this process, control it? more. First is what you call the infinite source method. If you want to have a preview, the next method is the finite source method. So in the infinite source method, you do what I illustrated before. You expose the surface of the solids to a vapor, and those vapor atoms diffuse in. And here are some profiles of those impurities that have been uh, diffused in. The concentration of those uh, impurities versus depth beneath the surface. Three conceptual curves are drawn to indicate what you have if you say if you just wait a little longer. So if you wait long enough, you start to get concentration deeper inside. Conversely, you can heat the substrate to a higher temperature. The diffusion happens a lot faster at higher temperatures. So either way, you, you can progress to these deeper profiles. You don't do a whole lot about the concentration at the surface. And that's because the vapor at the surface saturates the surface first. Then the impurities that have gone into the surface keep going in because the surface becomes saturated. These don't necessarily become progressively higher, maybe a little bit. I'll just leave them uh, all hitting at the axis here at the same place. What time and temperature do is they give you a deeper profile. And then there's the finite source method. No more vapor. Now instead you put a film of the dopant atoms on the substrate. Let that film diffuse in. And usually you do that thermally. So you take your silicon and you put this film of dopant material on and then you heat it up and the, the material slowly diffuses into the semiconductor. The longer you wait, 
the more evenly it diffuses in. What's different between this and the vapor is that a vapor in principle is just a constant thing. You just keep feeding vapor in and you just have an infinite reservoir of atoms. With the film, you can count the number of atoms, <laughs> literally. There's an exact number of atoms and you, you don't get any more. So once the whole film has dissolved into the semiconductor, there's no more left. The, this maximum concentration at the surface will go down if you wait. You start off with the concentration of the film, and eventually, after you've dissolved it all in, you know, all of the atoms in the film will be evenly, uniformly distributed throughout the semiconductor, and it'll look more like, more like this, this uh, orange curve here, the final distribution. Those are two ways to promote diffusion that, that are used. Just a little bit about why diffusion occurs. Diffusion of dopants into the crystal happen because there is a gradient of dopant concentration, more of them in one place near the surface than in another place deep inside. And so the atoms at the surface feel a force going to the other way. Think of it this way. You have these red atoms here, and these big black atoms, but the red atoms ignore the other atoms, the black, the, the matrix atoms. So the dopant atoms ignore the, the host atoms. They only listen to their own herd as they decide which way to go. If you have a whole bunch of dopant atoms to the left and not so many to the right, uh, they're, they're going to slowly work their way over, regardless of what the matrix atoms are doing. So this concentration gradient, dn by dz, n is the concentration of these red guys inside the material. Its gradient, as you go in, z, I didn't show it, z is you know, to the right. The gradient is basically the force. Let's do this whole thing because it really parallels the discussion we had before of carrier diffusion current in a semiconductor, including a continuity equation. Let's talk about the continuity condition here. Imagine then that I have this wire of semiconducting material and I have dopants that I'm feeding in the left end of it and they're slowly working their way up. This segment of length dz contains dn of those particles, these red dopant particles. Particle flux is the number of particles crossing this unit area per unit time. Uh, given by the letter F, we'll just call it DF. So the flux is the number of particles passing by per unit area per unit time. It's also the diffusion coefficient times the concentration gradient with a minus sign. Here's an equation that we'll be able to use. It's called fixed first law. This is what it means physically. Where the diffusion coefficient, big D, is temperature dependent. Temperature dependence is contained in this exponential. It's a, a coefficient times the thermal activation. If I want to talk about the temperature dependence of particle flux, there you go. You make it a lot warmer to see particles going by faster. That's fixed first law of diffusion, and it's exactly what we saw in chapter 2 with the uh, current density. That was fixed first law of diffusion as well. The diffusion coefficient times a gradient of charge concentration. When you go Q times N, you have charge concentration. Did you see the similarity there? The flux is the number of particles passing by per unit area per unit time. I'm going to bring this time in the denominator over to the numerator. So the flux times time is the number of particles passing by per unit area. Got that? Just common sense then tells me that I can also say what that is if I know the concentration change. Across that segment of the tube, n changes by dn. So dn is the, the number of particles that pass through a cross-section of the tube. That's particles per unit volume. That's what this N is, is particles per unit volume. You take particles per unit volume in that little tube and multiply it by the length of that little tube, you have the number of particles per unit area. Do you follow that? If you take particles per unit volume, multiply it by the length of that volume, you have particles per unit area. You gotta think about that. Why the minus sign? Because as I go from one end of the tube to the other end of the tube, I just go back and look. As I go from one end of this little segment to the other end, next end of that little segment, the number of particles per unit volume, the particle concentration, big N, goes down. So dn is a negative number. 
but I don't want to see a negative number. I just want to talk about the number of particles crossing per unit area. I don't want a minus sign in my number. So I'll put it in the expression instead because dn is inherently negative. That's also why it's in fixed law. This dn dz is that df dt, right? I'm mean, looking at it. They're the same thing. df dt is number of particles per unit area minus dn dz is number of particles per unit area. So just write it that way. Bring the dz over to one side and the dt over to the other side. And you have this little statement. The time rate of change of concentration, so the rate that the impurity concentration is changing, is minus the gradient of particle flux. It's the statement of continuity for the case of particles dissolving through a solid. That's the continuity equation. And if you do study equation 473 and compare it to this, I think you'll start to see the similarity, and so I encourage you to open your book up to page 108, where we discuss this in a totally different context, and you'll see the similarity. It's the same principle. To put it in words, just at that equation, dn by dt is minus df by dz, there it is. The rate that the local dopant concentration is increasing equals the gradient of dopant atom flux. Remember, flux is the number of dopants going by per unit area per unit time. That will get smaller as you move to the right in that tube, and hence the minus sign again. Put in this expression that we had for the flux from the previous, oops, up here. If I replace the f with minus d dn by dz, I'm going partials on these derivatives now because I think it's suddenly becoming evident that concentration of, of impurities depends on both time and position. So let's just use the partial symbol to be clear on that. The time rate of change of the concentration is minus d by dz times minus d dn by dz. That's uh, then cleaned up a little bit here. Minus sign is canceled, d comes out, it's a constant. And you have fixed second law of diffusion, which tells you that the rate that carrier concentration is changing is proportional to the concavity of the concentration gradient. Those are two key laws of diffusion, the first and the second law of diffusion. Now you have seen them uh, in this context. You've seen them in two contexts. Well, we didn't use the second law in chapter two, but we used the first law. We will continue with particle implantation next.